Welcome, my name is Kent Lennartson, and this webinar will talk about Kenefti and how Kenefti information can be used in MATLAB. So this first part here will just cover some basic can Kenefti knowledge, how to access can data and convert into something you can use in MATLAB, and how to avoid some problems when you connect to the CAN bus. If you compare classical CAN to CANFT, you find that in classical CAN you can only send up to eight bytes, but in CANFT you can send up to 64 bytes. And those bytes can in CANFT be sent at a higher bit rate. The CAN package is, have three segments. You have the CAN ID, which can be 11 or 29 bits. And then you have a data length code that tells you how many bytes that will be packed into the frame. And in classical CAN, this can be up to eight bytes. And in CANFT, it's from zero up to 64 bytes. The DLC is only four bits. So uh, for the first part is easy because zero to eight in the DLC is actually exactly the number of bytes in the package, zero to eight or zero to eight in CANFT. If you have higher numbers, 9 to 15 in can, classical CAN, uh, that will still be 8 byte. You can never send more than 8 byte. In CANFT, 9 means that you have sent 12 bytes and 10, 16, and so, have, so forth, as you can see in the table here. Uh, it means that if you want to send like 13 bytes, you have to extend it to, to 16 bytes uh, with dummy byte to send it into a CANFT frame because you have only those uh, number of bytes you can send in the package. So it's not free to send any number of bytes. So the biggest thing with CANFT is that you can send more bytes in each frame. And an overhead in eight byte classical frame is roughly 50%. And by increasing up to 64 bytes, the, the, the relation to the overhead is, is only 12%. So the longer frames, of course, will make delays for other messages. And in the figure below, you can see here uh, in top uh, uh, eight byte with this 50% overhead. And the middle frame is 64 byte, and you see that the overhead doesn't increase, so the overhead part is only 12% when you have those many bytes. And by the increase of bit rate, you can uh, shrink the length in time of, of the information transport. And you can see the last frame here is uh, 64 byte at eight times the bit rate. So the CAN package has three parts. The CAN ID in the beginning have a multifunction. It typically have the content used as a content identifier. So it, it tells you how to interpret the data that is packed into the frame. But it is also a priority. So the lower number CAN ID you have, the higher priority in the case you have a competing for the CAN bus. And it can also hold addresses like source address and destination ad address. And then here DLC that we have already covered and the data part, which in CANFT can be sent at a higher bit rate. So the next step is how do you convert the CANFT data and the CANFT frames into something that you can use in, in MATLAB? First of all, you need a CAN interface. Uh, so that converts the CAN bus signals into something that you can transport to a PC computer. And uh, the, the typically interface you can see here is all PC interface like USB, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and PCI Express. And it should be noted that if you buy a CAN interface, you have to check the support CANFT because not all products support CANFT. Next thing you have to find out is the bitrate. There are some typical bit rates, like 125, 250, 1000 kilobit per second. But actually, CAN bus can have any bit rate from 5 to 1000 kilobit per second. So you have to check which bit rate actually is used. And to decode information, uh, you need some kind of database that describes how to uh, identify different types by the CAN ID or something else.
So we look at the interfaces. Here you see the, the five types of interfaces from Quasar. You have the leaf, which is uh, one channel uh, USB interface, and USB CAN, which has two, uh, so you can connect to two different CAN buses. There is memorators, which can be used as interface or as a standalone logger to log information from the CAN bus. Uh, there is network based like Wi Fi or Ethernet, and there is a PCI family which use uh, in boards inside the computer and connected to the PCI bus. And when you get the CAN frame from the uh, CAN lib with the interface there, API, you will get the CAN ID, the data length code, and the data part, and that has to be interpreted. Uh, which typically is defined uh, to, to find something that matches in the database. The data is identified typically uh, as a part of the CAN ID. So you have to find that section that is defined in the database where uh, the data is identified by which bits in the CAN ID. Actually, it can be all 11 or 29 bits in a CAN ID that define the data uh, part, uh, the content and the data structure used for that good data. So typically, uh, can one CAN ID identify one unique uh, data structure. But it can also be that it's, it's, uh, the data is multiplexed, with typically the first byte uh, identify different data structures uh, of the for the rest of the bytes. And in worst case, there can be a stream of many CAN frames. Uh, so you have a start frame that starts the data byte flow, and then you have the middle part with a number of, of CAN frames and the end frames, and the CAN frame that ends the information flow. And then you have to merge all those CAN frames into one big uh, data structure before you can interpret it in, in MATLAB. So then we will look at some of the problems uh, that you have to consider when you connect uh, your CANFD interface to your CAN bus. So there is one problem with CANFD. All CANFD controllers can send legacy CAN frames, but if you have older units that is not designed according to the CANFD specification, they will send error frames if they see uh, uh, can FD frames. So you cannot use can FD frames in a CAN bus if there is old legacy CAN units connected there. But all can FD units send, can send the, 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 uh, the classical CAN frames. Uh, so you can still use the can FD interface for the old CAN buses. The second problem with CANFD is that it's a very precise configuration of the CAN bits, uh, typically the, the sample point and nominal bits that has to be designed very correctly. And to simplify this configuration of the, the CAN bit, uh, you should use uh, a common oscillator frequency in all connected modules. And it's suggested in CANFD that you should, you should support 20, 40 or 80 megahertz clocks uh, so you can always get the, the, the same setting of the, the CAN bit in all nodes. Before you connect to the CAN bus, you should ask the system designer to provide you information of the correct bit setting. And here you see a list of, of uh, nine parameters that has to be understood and, and set correctly to match uh, the communication uh, where you connect your CAN interface into and ma with MATLAB. So please check out uh, that you have all those numbers correct that match the system where you're going to use your CAN FD interface. So the general rules for, for those parameters is, uh, uh, first of all, you have to set up the, the correct bit rate. And the bit rate is just you take the number of uh, time quanta T seg one, add with the number of time quanta in T seg two, and add that with the sync segments one, and then you get number of time quanta that is making up one nominal bit. And if, if you multiply that number of time quanta with the period in nanoseconds of each time quanta, then you get the, the, the bit length of that can bit. And it one over this uh, bit length will be the bit rate. 
Next thing you have to do is to find the, the sync jump width dem demanded by the system. And if you take the sync with, jump width you're using and divide it by uh, the, the length of, of uh, the bit in time quanta, multiply by 20, uh, then and multiply 100%, then you get the maximum clock offset that you can handle uh, in the CAN bit. And that has to match all the other modules in, 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 the, in the system. Next, you have to do, define the sample point, which is uh, sync segment plus time segment one divided by the, the number of time quanta in the bit multiplied by 100, then you get the sample point in percent. And noted here in Kenefti, all units must have the, the same number here of the, the sample point location. In arbitration, we also have to handle delays and the, the part uh, that can handle de delays is uh, T seg 1 minus T seg 2. And that's the rest there uh, is what is available for delays. And delay have to have, uh, hand, have to handle round trip, which means that it has to come be multiplied by 0 0.5. Uh, and then you multiply it with the length of the time quanta. And then you get the maximum delay you can allow in your uh, CAN system. Of course, this is something that has to be calculated by the system designer. And the general rule for data bits are ex more or less the same uh, to the beginning. We, uh, the difference is the sampling point, because in here we don't have to consider the delays anymore. But when you increase the bit rate, you, you, you will have problem because the, typically the recessive bits become smaller and smaller relatively to the dominant bits. So you have to move the sample point a little bit to the rear uh, to protect the sample point from, from the late edges of the recessive bits. So typically you will use something in 60 to 70 percent sample point in the data part even. Uh, So the biggest pr problem is error frames. So if, if before you connect to the canvas and use it, check for error frames, because there is no reason why there should be any error frames in the work in communication. So please check for error frames. And if you see error frames, uh, try to repair the physical layer before you use uh, MATLAB uh, on this bus, because it, it, it's very annoying and problematic and to understand uh, the information if, if there are error frames as well. It should be noted that your CAN interface itself can cause error frames. And uh, there are five things here. First of all, of course, if you set the wrong bit rate, nominal or data rate, you will cause error frames. And if your uh, sample point dot doesn't match the sample point used in the, the CAN after systems, uh, you will also cause error frames. If your sync width is uh, too small, so it doesn't uh, handle the, the clock of oscillators offsets in, in, in all the ECUs, then you will also cause error frames. And TSEC2 has to be large enough to fit both the syncion width and other uh, noises that can call phase shifters and uh, damage your sample point. And of course, uh, the propagation segment, if there is a delay, uh, the difference between TSEG1 and TSEG2 has to be large enough to cover those delays in your, on your CAN bus. If you want to get this information repeaters, uh, you, you repeated, you can go to thequasa.com uh, and uh, there are two links, one for the CANFT information and another link for uh, all the CANF interfaces that's uh, available from Quasar. And if you have any problem with the Quasar CAN interfaces, you can always connect support and get some more information uh, to solve your problem. So this was the first part of this uh, webinar uh, covering the, the physical layer of CANFT. And uh, the next section here will describe how you get this information and utilize it in MATLAB.
Hello, my name is Jeremy Pyle. Uh, I'm a development manager here at MathWorks responsible for our vehicle network toolbox product. And I'm going to take us through the second part of our webinar here today, which involves CanFD data acquisition and visual visualization uh, using MATLAB software, MathWorks software, and Kavasser hardware. So MATLAB connects to CanFD systems via the vehicle network toolbox. The vehicle network toolbox has been around for uh, quite a while now. However, CANFD support was started to be added to the product in 17B, the 2017B release. Um, it took a few releases to, to fully support all the different workflows that the toolbox provides for CANFD, but we started with command line functions, moved on to various simulate blocks, including cogen and deployment workflows. And most recently, our current our 2021A release includes new apps for an out of the box uh, launchable network interface. Uh, capabilities, and that's going to be what we'll look at specifically today. So at this time, uh, Vehicle Network Toolbox basically uh, implements and provides functionality for complete CANFD workflows, uh, message reception, transmission, and signal, and message encoding and decoding, uh, and so on, log replay, and lots of different capabilities between the different elements uh, of MATLAB's platform. Uh, a connection to a live uh, live bus, live CANFD bus in Vehicle Network Toolbox is made through hardware. And of course, uh, MathWorks partners with Kavasser to provide these types of interfaces. So Vehicle Network Toolbox supports the full gamut of the Kavasser device family for CANFD workflows with new devices being added as they become available. Um, we've been working together for quite some time. Kavasser is also a connections partner with MathWorks, you can be guaranteed that you're going to get a good experience um, with Kavasser hardware and MathWorks tools working together. All right, from here, we'll move into a live demonstration of, of using our CanFD Explorer app uh, to make a CanFD connection and visualize some information. You can see a quick snapshot of what the app look like, looks like right there. And we'll spend a little bit of time going through different details, such as uh, how do I find Kavasser devices and such within MATLAB and VNT. Um, how do I get to the CanFD Explorer app? And once I'm uh, once I've launched it, once I'm ready to use it, um, how do I use it? How do I configure, set up my connection? How do I set up signal information that I want to look at? Um, and we'll go through all of those right now. So I'm going to take away our presentation. We're going to move over to a live running instance uh, of MATLAB. So this is the MATLAB desktop running, again, the 2021A release where the, the, the new Explorer apps will be first available. <clears throat> Prior to launching this MATLAB and, and being ready to use my Kavasser devices, there's just a simple step of, of installing uh, Kavasser drivers on the current host system. That's already been done. An easy way to check and verify that my devices are accessible is with the channel list function. In this case, specifically, we're calling CANFD channel list. So that vehicle network toolbox can tell me what are all the devices that it sees that are CANFD capable for connection on my system. And so um, we notice there uh, with the Kavasser drivers installed and the device plugged in, I have access to USB CAN Pro as well as virtual channels uh, from both the Kavasser driver and there are virtual channels included. Um, out of the box uh, with vehicle network toolbox as well. So my devices are, are configured, plugged in, and ready to be used. <clears throat> in terms of finding the apps, an uh, easy way to do that is to move across our uh, tool strip here to the apps section. We have a pull down. There's quite a few apps available in MATLAB now. What I'm specifically looking for here is our test and measurement section where the Explorer apps are located. So there's both actually a CAN Explorer for a classic CAN based system and CANFD Explorer, which of course is built for a CANFD based system. So you would make your choice of which app to use depending on the technology of the network that you're connecting to. Our focus here today, of course, is CANFD. So I've already launched the app. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. Looks very much like the picture that we had just shown. In this case, there's no data flow happening in the app. The app is offline. So everything is kind of blank and in, in, a, in a clean and ready state. <clears throat> you see there's a variety of controls available on the tool strip. We'll walk through each of those uh, as we go through the demonstration here. 
the next important section to look at here is the device list, and we can see all of the all of the devices and their channels that were enumerated in that channel list function that I had called are available also here in the device list for the app. So I've already pre-selected uh, Kvasser USB CAN Pro uh, device channel one. That's the one represented by the connection of the app in the app space here, and we can see there's a slight blue box um, around that specific device channel indicating that that's the one that's currently active. I can switch between these and launch different instances of the app for each one if I wanted to. In the app space itself, there's a couple different sections for visualizing information from the bus, uh, our message table, our signal table, and our signal scopes. And so, um, of course, signal table and signal scopes would be for showing decoded signal values uh, that come out of the messages of the network. And the message table here for more of the raw information, the raw frame uh, data and such that is available on the network. So working left to right across the tool strip, we're going to step through a little bit of app configuration. We'll go online, monitor um, a flow of, of synthetic uh, traffic that's being generated here in the background and show some of the more um, uh, configurable and like runtime elements of the app. So most CAN FD workflows, CAN workflows in general, um, involve more of an interest in the signal and application uh, values and data on the network rather than maybe just the raw message traffic. And the key to uh, encoding and decoding and visualizing signal data, of course, is generally using a database file or definition file, most commonly a DBC file. So if I open our database configuration dialog, we see here nothing's been configured yet. If I click add, um, I get a file browser. I'm already in the folder which has the DVC file of interest for this demonstration. So I can click on that. I can click open. That DVC file will be registered by the tool. Now it's showing up here in this file table. <clears throat> and that's all I need to do. Uh, hit OK. And now the DVC file is set in the app and the app will use it. Uh, or attempt to use it to decode all of the information that it pulls in off the network for visualization. The next configuration option here is called the device channel configuration, and this is really more for hardware setup. So uh, this is a CAN-FD device. We can see I have options to set both the arbitration bus speed as well as the data bus speed because CAN-FD has two different, uh, two different rates at which it can run. Um, Acknowledge mode allows me to either kind of have the hardware actively or passively uh, involve itself and contribute in the protocol details of the network. We're just going to leave that in normal. And then down here, we also have some message filters. So your system may have many more messages than you actually care to receive and visualize. And using the filters, you can block um, a variety, a configurable variety of traffic um, that you may not want the app to bother wasting time processing or presenting to you. And so the message filters for both standard and extended IDs are available for that. We're just going to go ahead and leave the filters open and let all the message traffic come through. So the last configuration step is to actually allocate some signals both to the table and the scope. So the signals of interest that we want to visualize. So if I hit this button here, we notice it's a pull down. <clears throat> it has four different options to be able to target the configuration of the signal table and each of the scopes that are available in the app independently. So we're gonna go ahead and open the signal table first and we see we have this signal configuration dialog. Um, all of the available signals is read from the database, the messages that are in there and the signals relevant or defined for each message are in this list. And so in order to configure something for vis visualization, um, in the app, I want to basically select and move it or um, kind of represent it on the right hand side, which is my configured signals list. Now, in our case, we only have four different messages defined for this network. They each carry you know, just one or two signals each, so there's not a tremendous uh, amount of, of data here. However, if you did have a system with many messages, hundreds or thousands of signals, this could be a lot to scroll through. So we do have some filtering. Uh, and search capabilities. So for example, I wanted to say, show me all the signals involving PWM. I can go ahead and type some text in the box here, hit find, and now this uh, available signals has, has executed a filtered search against what I typed up here. If I wanna go back to the full list, I can hit reset 
And those searches are executable both against signal names and message names, depending on what you might be looking for. Again, in our case, there's not that much data on this system. We're going to go ahead and just add them all um, into the signal table. So you can see as I did there, I clicked and then I, I kind of copied the signal from the left to the right. So now all six of the signals in my system, um, once I hit OK here, will now populate into the signal table. So the signal names are there, the message that they're defined for. We pulled some engineering unit values out of the database as well. There's no values, there's no time shown yet because again, we're still not online. The tool is dormant. Um, we need to actually go online before the flow of information starts to starts to show. But we're not gonna we're not done setting things up yet. We're gonna go ahead and add some signals to the scopes. The configuration dialog for the table and the scopes is identical. It's just a matter of which one are we targeting. So we're going to add a couple signals here to each one of our scopes. And I can add signals from different messages onto the same scope. We can see for each one of these, right, the axes are popping in. The configuration is getting set. Um, we can do multiple axes. I can do uh, n number of signals per scope. I can put the same signal in multiple scopes if I wanted to say cross-reference its value against some other signal types. A lot of flexibility, a lot of configuration uh, freedom for how you might want to represent your data here. So once we're all set, um, everything's been configured, my hardware is ready to go, my database is in there, and my signals are selected, we can go ahead and take the tool online. And now the flow of information has started. So we see the message table is filling in. Uh, the most recent message is on the top row and it's pushing down right, as things get old, older. Um, Timestamps are filling in for reference. The zero point of time was was relative to when I hit that button to go online. So the timestamp is a is a delta time from the the online moment. The messages here are being decoded. Not only do I see the raw ID, but I also see the message name. I see some protocol information. In this case, my CANFD frames are using the bitrate switch. My raw data is there. And the signals are starting to be decoded or they are being decoded. So the signal table is filling in, you know, the timestamps, you can see they roughly are matching between the messages and the signals that are carried within them. The values are changing here and the scopes are starting to shift. So these are live streaming scopes. They show the values of uh, the data off of the network um, as it's coming in you know, live to the flow of the tool. A couple other controls I can pause, uh, I can take the uh, or pause the visualization, but when I pause, the processing of data is still happening in the background, allowing me to continue. Notice I didn't start over. My timestamps continued um, as if nothing had happened there. I can stop, uh, which stops the flow of information entirely in the tool. However, now if I start again, all the information held is wiped and we start over with the new zero point. And at any time I can hit clear data and go ahead and wipe all of the current information out of the tool. Uh, there's a couple of like live visualization controls in the display section here. So, for example, um, if we look at the table right now, we see message A, message A, message B. The, the, all of these things are happening cyclically and kind of filling in as they happen. However, if I enable unique messages, now my table kind of shrunk down to only four rows. And so there's one row representing each unique uh, message that's present and, and being identified within the system. And that individual row is being updated with the latest instance of that message as it's identified. So if you're looking for a specific message and under, wanting to understand, OK, am I getting it? Is it refreshing? Is, is the communication happening like I expect? Then the unique messages view is pretty handy for that regard. I mentioned the timestamps again the, the, from a zero point when I hit the start button, they've been increasing steadily since then. However, if I enable the delta time, I can get a different type of time a different type of time information about the messages and signals on my network. And instead now of seeing the relative time, what I'm looking at is a delta time for each one of these individually. So you know, message A here uh, is roughly having 100 millisecond cycle time, message B 250 milliseconds, and message D about one second. And the delta time value visualization has changed both in the message table here and in the signal table. I can go ahead and put the tool back into its original state. I can use those controls while the while the tool is running to adjust things, uh, you know, as I see them as they're happening. 
So I'm going to go ahead and stop the, the flow of traffic. And just to point out, there are some controls here that you can uh, kind of look into and, and manipulate these uh, scopes in some ways. I can squish them. I can pan and zoom um, both on the X and the Y axes and move things around and restore uh, or fit basically in, in the Y direction. So if there's something particular that you wanted to pull into or hone in and look at, um, you're able to do that with those those controls. Now, one of the other common things that I might want to do is to be able to take this information, take this CANFD data um, to the MATLAB workspace and do more with it. Maybe I want to write some analysis functions or some scripts, um, do more processing and custom visualization. We have the ability to export from this tool to the workspace with just a click of a button. You see that dialog popped up with a little progress bar. Now it shows complete. So if I go back to the MATLAB uh, that was running the app, I see I have a second, um, second variable in my MATLAB workspace here. And if I take a look at this variable, it's named CANFD Explorer Messages, pretty clear, and it has a timestamp relative to when the table was created and the data was exported from the tool. So Vehicle Network Toolbox and MATLAB packages network information using MATLAB timetables. Um, timetables have been around for a little while now, but they're a very, very powerful variable uh, data type in MATLAB for packaging um, information like this, where we have consistent uh, consistently occurring time-based information. There's all kinds of built-in and very powerful analysis, synchronization, and interpolation uh, functionality built into the timetables. And so we use those in VNT. Um, in this case, we're looking at the message information. So we would call this a CANFD message timetable in vehicle network toolbox terms. And we can see the timestamps, the ID, the names, um, you know, protocol type, the raw data is all represented there, length, DLC, all the things that are relevant, of course, to a CAN frame. And the signal information, the decoded signals from this raw data, you know, using the database is all retained as well. So one other more powerful option that I can do next using Vehicle Network Toolbox is turn my message timetable into a signal timetable. And now, Um, <clears throat> from each of the individual frames that were decoded from the network, all of the signal values are represented in their own timetable. So if you wanted to use the information to plot signal values, put it into a Simulink model, or do any of that type of advanced workflow capability, this is really the packaging type that is most useful and immediately handy. And I'm able to accomplish that in just a couple of function calls and clicks. Uh, using Vehicle Network Toolbox and having come again from the Explorer app. One other um, kind of nice quality of life thing to note is that when a when a channel has been configured, so a database has been set, some signals have been configured, if I close the tool, the tool will retain the configuration that was set on an individual channel level, so I don't have to reset my database and reallocate my signals and such um, every time I, I might close my MATLAB down, go go away for lunch, and then come back and want to use the tool again. So it'll come back in exactly the same configured state. And again, that's per channel. So if I had different databases and different signals on, say, different hardware channels, because they were connecting to various networks in my system, it, it's all maintained separately. And of course, if you do want to go back to a blank slate, maybe I'm changing from connecting from one system to another, I can just enable a new session here and everything gets refreshed back to its its default state um, when I choose to do so. So that's CANFD Explorer and, and some of the crossover, uh, and some of the powerful MATLAB command line functionalities that Vehicle Network Toolbox provides in conjunction with using uh, external hardware like Kvasser devices. So we're going to go back to the presentation for just a quick moment. And we just want to mention that for more information you know, following today's webinar, um, there's a plethora of uh, details uh, and next steps available online. So um, at mathworks.com, you can find information on all of our products. Uh, every product has a landing page. In this case, the Vehicle Network Toolbox product page will show you um, about 
CanFD and the other technologies that the toolbox provides. And that's a great place to also go ahead and, and get a free trial and maybe try some of these things out firsthand yourself. In addition to just the general product page, uh, MathWorks also provides the documentation for all of its prod products uh, online. So the link is available there. Uh, you want to look at the specific functions and their capabilities, each individual simulate block and so on. Um, it's all there in the doc and also provided in the documentation is a wide array of examples showing CanFD workflows as well as other capabilities and functionalities of the product. <clears throat> Um, also hosted at MathWorks.com is our connections area where you can collect or, or go find more information about how MathWorks and Kvasser uh, products work together, as well as the hardware support page. As I mentioned, we support um, the, the, the gamut of available devices, and we try to keep that as current as possible. Um, so if you have a piece of Kvasser hardware with the CAN, and particularly CAN-FD, Network interface, rest assured that it will work with MathWorks and Vehicle Network Toolbox. So with that, we'll close this part of the webinar um, and move on to some uh, question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. That was awesome. Thank you, Kent. Um, that was great presentation and thought provoking because we've had a bunch of questions coming in actually during the presentations. Um, so, Jeremy and Kent, if you guys want to open up your cameras and your mics, um, let's take, we've got a little time in the presentation now to do kind of a live Q&A. Anything we don't get to here, we will answer an email. So if you ask a question and we can get to it, we'll, we'll get to it. If you have a question now, you can keep adding it. We'll see if we can, we can add those. Um, Jeremy, let me start off with you. There was a number of questions about kind of versions and which version of MathWorks um, has the CanFD Explorer um, when J1939-22 supports coming. Can you speak to a few of those? I think you saw those popping in. Yep, absolutely. So the, the apps are new features that are available in uh, our 2021A, um, so which just recently I, sh I think shipped publicly last month uh, and is available now. Um, I, regarding the other protocol support, the, I think there was some questions related to do they, do they support CAN and, and the J1939? So one of the things that we did with the apps is we actually made two. Um, so in the gallery there, you'll find a CAN Explorer and a CAN FD Explorer. And you would just pick the app that matches the technology of the system that you're connecting to. If it's a classic CAN system or a CAN FD CAN system, most of the interfaces in the toolbox work that way. So there's different function sets for CAN versus CAN FD, different simulink blocks for CAN versus CAN FD, and we, we pattern the apps the same way. Um, at this time, we don't have an app built for J1939. Um, it's definitely on our interest to make a, a J1939 Explorer. Um, I can't say when that might come, but it's, it's definitely something that we're looking at, <clears throat> as well as other, um, I'd say, more expanded J1939 capabilities. I would point out there there is some there is some new capability related to J1939 also in the 21A release. Um, it has to do with using timetables and actually some of the some of what we demonstrated in MATLAB for CANFD also enabled for J1939 uh, signal data, parameter groups, and that sort of thing. So there is some new capability to explore there. Excellent. Um, for people that, I'm sure customers know this, but if somebody has an older version of MathWorks, what's the easiest way to upgrade and actually get the, the new CANFD Explorer app? Um, I think that depends on on how their license is set up. Um, a lot of customers maybe um, have it available if they through, through maintenance agreements and so on. Um, okay. And certainly corporate customers often now have enterprise level licenses that make the new releases available to them. So you could check with your your IT or your license holders at your company uh, for an individual holder. Feel feel free to reach out directly to MathWorks Sales Support. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Kent, let me, there was a couple of questions early on. Um, one question that came up as we were prepping for these sessions, actually regarding just CanFD in general. Can you talk about when classical CAN and CanFD are on the same bus? Um, how does that bus act? What, uh, you talked a little bit about pitfalls early on. Are there different pitfalls when we've got regular classical CAN and CanFD nodes interacting? I know this is a big question, so <laughs> you probably have to cut it down to some sort of short version of an answer. 
yeah, the short version is that the new CANFT interfaces, the so CANFT controllers, they can uh, uh, run on all uh, old CAN uh, buses. So it's only if you uh, you use the CANFT functionality, which doesn't match, uh, doesn't work together with old classical CAN controllers. But the CANFT control itself uh, can communicate with any CAN controller. Yeah, so it's backwards compatible, maybe is the way yeah, to say it's backward that. compatible, but you cannot use the new functionality in the old uh, designs. So if you have classical CAN nodes on the bus, don't pump CAN FD messages onto it because you'll screw them up. Yeah, well, it's very easy because all the classical CAN will just send error frames in until you get dead. Yeah. So if you, if you do that as a CAN FD controller, you will get, get bus off very soon. Okay. Um, I think in your presentation, you've got your contact info. I just want to invite participants that if you're dealing with physical layer issues on CANFD, because there's a number of requirements around um, kind of the, the performance level of the wiring and stuff, Kent is a great resource on that. So feel free to contact him. Just volunteered you up, Kent. Sorry about that. <laughs> yep. uh, Jeremy, let me pop over to a qu couple questions on MathWorks, because there were a number coming in at the end regarding um, features available in MATLAB. Um, I'm just looking through these. Uh, I've used, I'm going to just directly read the question. I've used Colossal Can King in the past to collect CAN data with Colossal Hardware and then exported it to MATLAB. What are the advantages of using MATLAB directly to log the data? Yeah, so you could you could use either tool depending on what your workflow is. Um, I know Colossal started to support MDF files, and so we've got some pretty powerful. Um, data exchange capabilities now to to use loggers and export via mdf and then import via mdf using matlab um, i think you might want to choose say matlab um, over can king if you were looking to uh, have the tool or you were doing the interfacing the acquisition be the same where you wanted to perform a lot of the actual data analysis right if you were <clears throat> using matlab functions and building scripts and, and data analysis and visualization capability or perhaps if you were doing some model-based design and building algorithms and such in Simulink, <clears throat> it gives you the ability to bring all of that network capability you know, into one single tool and use the use a singular tool chain. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my understanding is kind of Crosser has data loggers, which will log to an SD card, which is more of a, a real-time logging. But once you make the break and you're going into the PC, which you kind of break the real-time flow at that point, um, going into MATLAB or going into CAN King, it really just becomes about the features you want to utilize in the software at that point, right? Right. Yep. Um, well, interesting. Do we? This is another question. I'm just going to read directly. Do we need any other toolboxes or drivers other than Vehicle Network Toolbox for CAN interfaces to be installed? Um, so, in terms of toolboxes, no. The demonstration that we gave today was based entirely with just MATLAB and VNT only. Um, in terms of drivers, you would need the, the system drivers for the Kvasser hardware, of course, for that to work, uh, whether you're on Windows or Linux. <clears throat> um, that's it. I think you showed at the beginning installing those drivers, right? Or you called them and they were already installed on your machine. Yeah, yeah pretty much. They, they, everything was pre-set up, the hardware was plugged in, and, and really that, that's all it takes. Just launch MATLAB with the toolbox and you're good to go. Okay, cool. Um, Okay, this is a question on DBC database. Does the MATLAB CANFD Explorer support extended signal multiplexing in the DBC database? So our, our DBC support and our signal decoding support in general does honor multiplexing. Um, you might want to do a little bit of extra research on, on extended multiplexing. I think that adds maybe a little bit extra layer of complexity. But um, <clears throat> within the app itself, you would be able to select multiplex signals and they would be, you know, they would be decoded the honoring of the multiplexor and the multiplexes and such would be, um, would be presented. Okay. That, um, I, I think this one, I mean, all of them, we will follow up with email, but this one particularly, Jeremy, I think might be something better answered in email. It sounds like there could be some more nuance to that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple other ones I highlighted as, as the presentation was going. I was able to kind of keep an eye on the Q&A, so I've got a few of them highlighted here. Um, oh, this was an interesting question that came up. Like, once again, this was in the prep for the session today. 
can I build an application with MATLAB and Kavasa Harbor that can be run on computers that don't have MATLAB? Can you like build an app and install it on a machine and it runs without having the licensed version of MATLAB present? Yep, so absolutely. Um, we have what we call the MATLAB coder, MATLAB compiler, <clears throat> which allows you to take MATLAB functions, UIs and such, and, and build them into standalone executables that run against a, a core MATLAB runtime engine that gives you the ability to kind of share, distribute, and run MATLAB-based applications without the MATLAB desktop. And that capability is supported through the pretty much the full gamut of vehicle networks vehicle network toolbox features and the hardware interface and data processing. So absolutely supported. Is that built into the to kind of the normal MATLAB license or is that again a separate uh, thing you have to add on? Yeah, that would require some extra add-ons. There's a there's a coder product and such that would be part of the, the tool chain too for those workflows. Okay, great. I can ask these questions because I'm with Kavasar, not with MathWorks, so I can ask you the dumb questions. <laughs> if anybody's on the call and wondering, then if you, um, are a heavy user of math, which you probably already know the answers, but uh, I'm happy to fill in and help those of us who don't uh, get some, some easy answers there. Um, I'm looking up, we've actually had a number of questions come in during the Q&A in the last, whatever it's been, 10 minutes, five, seven, 10 minutes. Um, let me look at those really quick. I'm gonna read this. Um, can you save CAN sessions? This is in MATLAB, I'm assuming, in the um, CAN of the Explorer. Can you save CAN sessions? For instance, if I use the same hardware to connect to many different systems very often, I'd want to save those configurations to access them quickly. Yeah, so I think that, that question might have been written from the perspective of the app. So like we mentioned, the, the app will maintain its state. So for each given like discrete channel, <clears throat> when you close it down and load it back up, the configuration will, will be restored. Um, if you wanted to say, you know, set up a, a connection on one channel and apply those settings to another channel, we don't have that capability yet. Um, it is on our on our plan, uh, you know, future roadmap to be able to say like export the configuration in the tool and potentially share it, you know, or load it to a different channel or load it to another machine. We don't have that um, kind of save external save and load capability yet, but it's it's in with a a pretty healthy list of uh, future plans for the apps. This is really just a version one, I'll say. Um, mm. You uh, have big hopes and, and big ideas for what we want to do with these apps going forward. I think there was also a question about allowing generation or you know can transmission um, in the apps as well. Um, for version one, they're reception and visualization only, but absolutely building transmission and bu building more expansive capabilities is in our plans. So. Things more more things will come in time. <clears throat> and you guys do I think two software releases a year, A and B, spring and fall, I believe, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. So we can look for more updates at those junctures. Um, I'm gonna uh, zoom out of the Canopy Explorer app for a minute and just look at Canopy Can in general. This is a very broad kind of more theoretical question for you, Ken. Um, maybe it's a trick question. We'll see. CAN and CANFD falls under which layer of the seven OSI layers? This is kind of a really big picture question, just about where CAN sits in network architecture in general. Where, where does it sit in that seven OSI layer model? Uh, basically, uh, CAN is a layer two uh, functionality. Uh, the problem with it, with the CAN when it was designed, was it, it, it's included some function that actually should be on layer three and like layer four uh, maybe even layer five which is like resending crc checking uh, prioritize the the sending and things like that it's actually a higher layer uh, and the problem is that can is is a multi-drop uh, protocol and uh, the I oc module is designed for point to point uh, where, where you uh, so so but oh, yeah. the designer of of can decided that they should add some functionality that will help the users to to just have an application seven layer to uh, and communicate without having making the layer two three and four and five yeah well, and that then, can be some confusing sometimes and correct me if i'm wrong but it, it's also can be a little bit confusing from an end user perspective because can deals with the physical layer deals with the messaging can deal with crc checking and stuff but then we get into like j1939 which is um 
people will say it's the same as CAN, and it's not really. It's actually a um, protocol that sits on top of CAN. I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit, or CAN Open, or Air Inc, or any of these other um, higher layer protocols. Mm. That, that's because uh, CAN is very low level. It's only send bits, and somebody has to define how to start interpret the bits, uh, and that's why you need uh, the higher layers like J1939 and uh, can open and 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 et al. So uh, yes, so so they are more to to describing how do you interpret the information in some standard way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, thank you. That's interesting about the point to point versus the um, the drop architecture makes it not quite a good fit for the OSI layer model. Hopefully that's that's insightful for me. Hopefully it's insightful for some, for some people, and particularly uh, for Putham who asked it. Um, I'm looking back through, looks like a couple more questions have come in. Uh, maybe you ask, answer this, Jeremy. I'll ask it again. Forgive me if I'm repeating this. I'm kind of reading as we go. Also, after exporting data to workspace as timetables, is there any function to decode, decode signals using a DBC? He says it's been a while since he used the functions in the toolbox. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we demonstrated was in terms of exporting messages from the app to the workspace, the signal decoding in that workflow actually comes with it. Um, so if you recall back to what we did, we set a database in the app itself. All of the incoming information was decoded <clears throat> as it was acquired. And then when that the totality of that information is exported to the workspace in the timetable, it includes um, the, the IDs resolved into message name, and it includes the signal values resolved from the raw message data as well. One of the columns of that timetable is actually called signals, and within it is a structure for each row, each frame, <clears throat> with the decoded signals for, for those. Uh, but the toolbox, in its functionality, does provide the ability to apply database decoding in a couple of different ways. Um, there's command line functions to create a CAN channel connection to, to a bus and a piece of hardware, and then use a database to decode the, the message data as it comes in that way. Um, if you were to import, whether that's be an MDF file or some other type of, excuse me, some other type of log, and you just had raw frame information and your DBC file, absolutely, we can take, we can import the raw frame information, we can load the DBC file using uh, provided command line functions and then put the two together to make a decoded timetable. And then what we demonstrated as well was kind of two different timetable concepts, one that was based around the messages and then one that was based only around the signals. And there's again a built-in function to kind of translate from the message table to the signal tables. And <clears throat> um, if what you care about is just that time-based um, decoded application level engineering unit signal data, um, we try to make that as easy as possible to get to. Um, so yeah. you know, check out the doc and, and you can see the whole function set of the toolbox and the CAN message timetable, CAN FD message timetable, the signal timetable functions, uh, CAN database function. Those are the ones you want to look at. Yeah, it sounds like regardless of the route, the answer is yes. Ex importing the MDF, translating as you go, um, separating signal versus message. That's cool. Exactly. Yeah. Many different ways to to come through that that path, depending on what your workflow is or your use case is. Um, we're right up at the end of the time. Um, any final comments, Jeremy or Kent? Not that you need to have any, but if you had one, this is this is your last chance, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up the webinar here. Yeah, I am all set. Thank you very much for listening and interesting questions. Yeah, I would say the same. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, we're really excited for this release. It's a major release for the toolbox um, and a new, a whole new feature direction to have these kind of applications, out of the box applications available. So you know, give give them some use, and we're excited to hear feedback about what what folks want to see in in future expansions. So. Excellent. Thank you guys both. Thank you for attending today. Um, you will get answers to questions via email. When I close out here, you will get a one question survey. If you could stay and answer it really quickly, it'll just help us tailor future webinars to make sure we're addressing topics you actually care about. For example, J1939 was a hot topic today. If you have other topics that you think would be valid, please input those on the survey. But other than that, we are going to sign off. And so thank you guys so much. Thanks for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you.